In this lesson, we're going to talk about what neuroleptic malignant syndrome is, why it occurs, the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a potentially life-threatening condition involving excessive inhibition of dopamine receptors. We're going to talk a bit more about this later on when we talk about the pathophysiology, but it has to do with an excessive inhibition or antagonism of dopamine receptors. This condition may affect up to 3% of patients on antipsychotic or neuroleptic medications. This is where the name neuroleptic comes from. Neuroleptics are another word or another name for antipsychotic medications. And this condition is considered a psychiatric emergency. We're going to talk a bit more about the management of neuroleptic malignant syndrome later on in this lesson. There are particular risk factors for getting this condition. One of them is a rapid increase in medication dosing. So if the dose of the antipsychotic that a patient is on is rapidly increased, this can cause this condition. Addition of a new dopamine antagonist when a patient is already on one, this can also increase the likelihood of neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurring. Being male is also another risk factor, and being young, so these are both risk factors that can increase the risk of this condition occurring. Dehydration and or malnourishment can also be a risk factor. We can see exhaustion being a risk factor as well, and having a medical illness if a patient is on an antipsychotic and they become medically ill, that also increases the risk of having this condition due to issues with dosing of medications. Let's talk about the causative medications for this condition. This condition is actually associated with the use of almost all neuroleptic medications. So medications that antagonize or inhibit dopamine receptors, particularly D2 receptors, are going to be the medications that can cause this condition. So the first group of medications that are going to be the most commonly implicated in this condition are the typical antipsychotics or the first generation antipsychotics. So these are going to be the most commonly reported medications that can cause this condition and these include haloperidol and fluvenazine. So haloperidol or haldol is a medication that is often associated with this condition. And chlorpromazine is also another medication that is associated with this condition. And then another group of medications are the atypical antipsychotics. These are going to include the second and third generation antipsychotics. So we can see with olanzapine, clozapine, risperidone, quetiapine, and aripiprazole. These are going to be less likely to cause this condition compared to the first generation antipsychotics, but they still bring their own risk of causing this condition, especially if there are other risk factors we talked about before. Other medications can also increase the likelihood of this condition, especially if a patient is on these antipsychotics at a stable dose. If there's an addition of an antidopaminergic antiemetic medication like metoclopramide, droperidol, domperidone, and prochlorperazine. These can all cause this condition if they're improperly dosed or if they're in combination with some of these other medications we talked about before. Now, although many of the medications that cause this condition are dopamine antagonists, withdrawal of dopaminergic medications can also cause this condition. So if a patient has been on a dopaminergic medication before for long periods of time, particularly at higher doses, and then they withdraw those medications, especially if they withdraw them rapidly, this can lead to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So some of those dopaminergic medications include the Parkinsonian medications, levodopa and amantadine. So especially if these medications are stopped and especially abruptly stopped, this can increase the likelihood of neuroleptic malignant syndrome occurring. And this can really be from any dopamine agonist as well. And then some other medications that have been associated with this condition include lithium, especially if there's very, very high doses of lithium. So there are reports of lithium toxicity leading to or being associated with neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Phenylzine can also be another medication that can cause or lead to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Phenylzine is a monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And then we can see it with the TCA antidepressants, disipramine, and trimipramine. So both of those can also play a role in increasing the risk of neuroleptic malignant syndrome, especially if in combination with some of these other medications. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The pathophysiology is not entirely understood, but it's believed to be due to excessive dopamine or D2 receptor antagonism. So excessive blocking of D2 receptors, especially in particular parts of the brain, in the nigrostriatal pathway, the hypothalamus, and the spinal cord. So with regards to the nigrostriatal pathway, it's connected to the substantia nigra. This is very important in movement. So this pathway is very important in movement. So due to the 
inhibition of D2 receptors in this pathway, this can cause some of those movement issues we're going to talk about later on in this lesson. Changes in the hypothalamus. So this excessive D2 blockade can also cause changes in the hypothalamus. It can change the set point in the hypothalamus to lead to a fever, which is going to be a hallmark finding in this condition. So that's the reason why. And then the spinal cord is the other part of the central nervous system that is affected. And then it's also believed that the antipsychotics can cause calcium release in peripheral muscles. So it leads to calcium being released from sarcoplasmic reticulum in the muscles, which then leads to increased contractility. So this is all going to tie in with the signs and symptoms we're going to talk about in the next slide. Now let's talk about those signs and symptoms. When do signs and symptoms actually occur? When a patient has added a new dopamine antagonist medication or increased the dose of a dopamine antagonist, oftentimes the symptoms of neuroleptic malignant syndrome occur within 4 to 14 days of starting the medication. Most often they're going to occur within 10 days. And within those 10 days, they start to have symptoms that are going to be remembered by the mnemonic FARM. FARM is going to be a mnemonic that's going to help us remember the categories of signs and symptoms that occur in this condition. So F in FARM is for fever, A is for autonomic dysfunction, R is for rigidity, and M is for mental status changes. So these are going to be the hallmark findings in this condition. And when this condition does begin to display signs and symptoms, the signs and symptoms are going to evolve over the course of 24 to 72 hours. With regards to a fever, we talked about the hypothalamus being affected by that excessive D2 blockade and changing the set point within the hypothalamus. This is going to lead to a fever. It's going to lead to a temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius. We can also see autonomic dysfunction. So we can see tachycardia, which is a high heart rate. So a heart rate greater than 100 beats per minute hypertension or high blood pressure. And this blood pressure may be labile, so it can be very, very high. It can go extremely high, and then it can come down very quickly as well. So it can be very labile. Tachypnea can also occur. This is an excessive or increased respiratory rate, a respiratory rate greater than 20 breaths per minute. Diaphoresis or excessive sweating can also occur. We can see pallor, we can see hypersalivation, and we can see hypoxemia occurring as well. And with this hypoxemia and tachypnea, we can see dyspnea or shortness of breath. Now, along with the fever and autonomic dysfunction, rigidity is going to be a very key hallmark finding in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's going to be a generalized or global muscle rigidity. So muscle rigidity is increased muscle tone. This rigidity is going to be very severe and it's going to be oftentimes what is called lead pipe rigidity. So the muscles become very, very rigid and this occurs throughout all movement. So when a clinician does a physical examination on a patient and tries to move their muscles, the rigidity is throughout the entire movement and oftentimes the ability to actually flex certain muscle groups becomes very inhibited. So it becomes like a lead pipe. So it's very, very stiff and rigid. Mental status changes are also another hallmark finding in neuroleptic malignant syndrome. They're often the initial symptoms. So this includes changes in level of consciousness, confusion, delirium, and this can lead to stupor and eventual coma. So very important to keep an eye on this as well. Some other important factors to remember with regards to the clinical features of this condition include the following. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is going to oftentimes have limited gastrointestinal symptoms. So this condition is often compared to serotonin syndrome. In serotonin syndrome, gastrointestinal symptoms are much more common. There's going to be issues with diarrhea, for instance, but in this condition, we're not going to see that. It's going to be very uncommon or not occur at all. We can also see Parkinsonian features occurring in this condition, like a shuffling gait and a tremor. Patients can also experience issues with dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, incontinence, and mutism, and then also renal failure. Oftentimes, the renal failure can be due to muscle breakdown from all that rigidity. So there can be release of myoglobin from the muscles that can cause damage to the kidneys. So renal failure is going to be a very significant complication from this condition. It's going to increase the morbidity of this condition, and it's also going to increase the risk of mortality from this condition as well. So there are a subset of cases that can lead to mortality. So this is a very, very severe condition, and it is a psychiatric emergency. How is this condition diagnosed? There's actually no specific laboratory test 
to make the diagnosis of the condition. But what is found is that there is increased creatine kinase. So from the muscles, there is increased CK or creatine kinase. There's also increased AST and ALT. There's also myoglobinemia and myoglobinuria. So myoglobin in the blood and myoglobin in the urine. There is also leukocytosis and metabolic acidosis. So the most important ones here are going to be the increased creatine kinase, increased AST and ALT, and leukocytosis. So these are going to be often found in this condition. There are some other laboratory findings that can occur, and these include hyperuricemia, which is a high uric acid level in the blood, hyperphosphatemia, which is a high phosphate level in the blood, hyperkalemia, which is a high potassium level in the blood, hypocalcemia, which is low calcium level in the blood, increased alkaline phosphatase can also be found, thrombocytosis or increased platelet count, and decreased serum iron. And there are some other ones as well that are not listed here. The DSM-5 also has a diagnostic criteria for making the diagnosis of this condition. There are major and minor criteria. The major criteria involve three different criteria that all have to be met. These include exposure to a dopamine antagonist medication. So one of those medications we talked about earlier on in this lesson. There also has to be severe muscle rigidity and a fever. So two of the farm signs and symptoms we talked about before fever, and severe muscle rigidity. And there also has to be minor criteria, and at least two of these have to be met. So these include diaphoresis or excessive sweating, dysphagia, problems, swallowing, a tremor, incontinence, altered level of consciousness, mutism, tachycardia, hypertension or labile, blood pressure, leukocytosis, and increased creatine kinase. So some of those laboratory measurements can also be utilized as minor criteria for making the diagnosis. How do clinicians treat this condition? Before we get into treatment, prevention is going to be key here. So avoiding or trying to avoid rapid dose increases or additions of other dopamine antagonists. If this condition does develop, this is a psychiatric emergency. We talked about this before. So ICU management is often going to be required or is going to be advised. And the key to treating this condition is discontinuing all neuroleptic agents, along with supportive treatment like hydration and cooling blankets. And then there's some other pharmacotherapies that can also be employed to help reduce some of the symptoms of this condition. And these include bromocryptine, which may help with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and dantrolene, which is a muscle relaxant. These don't have a huge amount of evidence behind them, but they can be used in some cases. And what is often noted is that symptoms will most often resolve within one to two weeks after discontinuation of the neuroleptic agents. If it is a depot medication, so if it has been a regular injection, it could take months for the symptoms to completely resolve. But oftentimes, if it is oral medication, it can be resolved within one to two weeks. If you want to learn more about serotonin syndrome, please check out my lesson on that topic. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks much for watching and hope to see you next time.